Good evening, everybody. I'm grateful for you all being here this evening. Uh, we're going to uh, start another name tonight. Amen? Uh, amen. Tonight, we're going to be looking at a name of Christ and a place. And we're going to talk about how the name both fits the place and the person. And in such, in such, uh, without God, without God, this earthly tent that we live in is nothing but a shell. Nothing but a shell. I want you to bow with me as we seek the Lord's face on the rest of the evening. Father in heaven, greatest God Almighty, I thank you, Lord, for this day, and I praise you for each and every man and woman, boy or girl, uh, in earshot within this congregation, uh, under this roof, upstairs with the teenagers, the junior high through the high school, down the hallway with elementary and the uh, even the nursery, Lord. Praise you for our visitors near and far. We praise you for those who you've brought back from Oklahoma. We pray, Father God, for your peace among us all. Pray for the peace of the nations. Indeed, we pray for peace in this nation. We pray for our leadership, Lord. We pray that you, you will get their attention and help them to make you their leader. Lord, help us to follow your lead in all things. Help us not to run ahead. Help us not to take for granted. Help us not to presume upon you, your grace or your mercy. But instead, in gratitude, may we humbly seek your face. May we humbly seek your face, your will, and desire to do, to do your word. Lord, I pray that your word will go forth and accomplish that tonight. That your Holy Spirit will draw near to the man or woman, boy or girl, listening in person, on the radio, over the internet. Regardless of where you may find them, Lord, I know you know exactly where they are. May your word, may your word embolden them. May the name of your son, Jesus Christ, comfort them. May his sinless life, his vicarious death, and his resurrection convict them that he alone is necessary for the salvation and save it to be saved from sins. He alone is an all-sufficient sacrifice for sins. Father God, help us to love you because you loved us first. We love you, Father, and we pray again that you will save souls. The saved will be obedient through believers' baptism. You'll continue to grow Desert Hills Baptist Church one born-again, baptized believer at a time, and that you will call men and women, boys and girls, into the ministry. And then help us, Lord, to help them through prayer and whatever else we can do through you. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' precious name and all of God's people said, amen and amen. Well, as I, as I said momentarily ago, we're going to be talking about another name of Jesus in our names of Jesus, names and titles of Jesus Christ in the Old and New Testament. Uh, we just finished the Rose of Sharon and the Lily of the Valleys uh, last Wednesday and Sunday. Today is one of my favorite names of Jesus. That's the name of Shiloh, the name of Shiloh. Shiloh uh, is a sweet name coming off the lips to me. It just feels good to say Shiloh, Shiloh. It's derivative uh, in the words uh, Salem or Shalom, it means peace, tranquility. And in such, Jerusalem is the city of peace. Shalom is what you wish people. Shalom be unto you. And here, Shiloh, Shiloh in uh, Genesis chapter, chapter 49 in verse 10, uh, we see what Brother... Daryl read a reference to the person, a reference to the person. Uh, in context, let me give a little background. Here in Genesis chapter 49, we have Jacob giving the patriarchal blessing to his 12 sons uh, right before he dies. In fact, two people die in these next two chapters, 49 and 50, Jacob and then Joseph. Jacob gives these patriarchal blessings, and in such, he gives 
prophetic words over each tribe. Uh, but none greater, none greater than chapter 49 of Genesis and verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. Rest assured, both Christian theologians and even uh, Jewish rabbis all agreed that this is reference to Messiah. Of course, we accept Jesus Christ as the fulfillment of this scripture. But both Jewish, uh, Jewish historians and, and biblical scholars in the Torah and Talmud and Christian uh, uh, theologians agree that this is a direct reference to the Messiah. We, again, we recognize Jesus as the Messiah. It says, Shil until Shiloh come, and unto him uh, shall the gathering of all the, of the people be. Now that being said, I told you we're going to talk about the place and the person. Before we get into the personage of Shiloh, let us talk about the place. There was a place called Shiloh. A place, if you will, called peace. A place called tranquility. There's a place on the moon called Tranquility Base. Did you know that? Tranquility Base. I guess one of the Apollo missions landed there. But there was a place in Canaan that they called Shiloh, that they called Tranquility. It's where they first came into the Promised Land and they cast lots to divide up the land amongst the 12 tribes. They cast the lots to di divide up the land amongst the 12 tribes. And in doing so, this was where the tabernacle came to its final resting place. Uh, if you don't know, the tabernacle was basically the tent, the tent that was given, uh, the dimensions of which were given to Moses and the Levites to build that the Ark of the Covenant would rest in through the wilderness for 40 years. Uh, it didn't matter. They followed the pillar of fire at night, the pillar of smoke during the day. Wherever the pillar of fire or smoke rested, that's where they would break from formation and they would lay stake down to put up the tabernacle, put up this tent, where again, the Shekinah glory of God would rest and the Ark of the Covenant, that which represented our God, with the mercy seat and the two seraphim angels whose wings spread over it would be. It's funny to me, David, later on in First and Second Samuel, he says to himself, Self, here I stand and sit and sleep in a palace, and my God, my God rests in a tent. And God reminds him, I don't sleep in a tent. I don't sleep in anything made by hands. God is everywhere at all times. But yet God, God in his sovereign, omnipotent wisdom said, my representation on this earth will be a tent, that which can be folded up and taken to another place. Hence, when Paul says, we live in this mortal coil, we live in this tent, Paul was a tent maker, I do believe it was a direct reference back even to the tabernacle. We will fold up this tent one day. And what will happen? We will be translated to another place. But you know something? One day, this tent will be taken back up. And we will be resurrected with him. Amen? Amen. So we see in the tabernacle that it comes to rest at Shiloh. It spends almost 400 years at Shiloh in peace this place of tranquility, uh, this, this meeting place, if you will, uh, this place where they were commanded to come, the only place they were commanded to come three times a year uh, before the Lord and give offering uh, for almost 400 years, 100 times more uh, than it had spent in the wilderness with those who were wayward and walked faithless. 100 times more it sat there uh, with the Ark of the Covenant until one day in First Samuel chapter 4, you don't have to go there, one day somebody gets the bright idea they're going to take the Ark of the Covenant out of the tabernacle and they're going to trot it before them into battle with the Philistines. No one told them to do that. No one, no one told them to do that. You can find that in Judges. Uh, but I'll tell you this. See, Eli, 
Eli was the high priest at the time. We talked about him and his sons, those boys of Belial. And Eli was, uh, well, he was a permissive parent and a negligent pastor, a negligent priest. Well, he let them take it into battle. Not only did Israel suffer defeat, but guess what? After 400 years of the tabernacle, this, this tent whose dimensions came from God, whose, whose structure was commanded by God, even the materials of which to build it, 400 years sitting tra tranquilly in the place called peace. Not only was Israel defeated, but the tabernacle was destroyed. Shiloh was a place. What I want to tell you is this. To me, in my study, in my prayer, in my meditation this week on Shiloh, thinking about both the place and the person, I thought it important not just to draw parallel and tell you about Shiloh, Jesus Christ, but to remind you that unless, unless the Holy of Holies resides in this mortal coil, in this tent, it's going to be destroyed. The ark never returned to Shiloh. After it was destroyed, it never returned to Shiloh. David made a little bit of a tent for it, commanded it to to be taken care of by one of, one of the men in Israel, but it never returned to Shiloh again. As a matter of fact, God uh, tells Jeremiah later on, he says, hey, you know what? You go check out Shiloh, where the tabernacle used to be. Go and see what I, th I think of my people who walk wayward from me, who do not love me but follow after idols, wh whose word you cannot trust whose lips do nothing but lie, whose hands do nothing but shed blood. Go and see. Go back to Shiloh and see what I think of them. Look at the tabernacle. It was desolate. It was laid bare. No, my friends, Shiloh at one time had the representation of our God in a humble tent, if you will, of a once nomadic people come to rest in the land of promise, gone wayward, doing what was right in their own eyes, each unto himself, instead of seeking God. And in such, they transgressed. They took what was holy and profaned it. They took what was holy, they pulled it out of its place, its rightful place, and used it, well, <laughs> here's the way it was put in my study this week. They used it like a lucky charm. That's the people that, you know, they carry around their pocket, their, their, their pocket New Testament, you know. That's why it's, well, so, uh, hey man, I carried this all the way through Nam. So, you love your neighbor? I can't stand my neighbor. <laughs> That's like that New Testament's meaningless to you then. Why? What is that? That's a lucky charm to you. Better that you put that New Testament in your eye and make it go into your heart than to carry it around in your breast pocket. Amen or oh me. It's the difference between being religious and defeated and having the person of Shiloh and being victorious. And we've talked about the place. Let's talk about the person. Jacob gives this patriarchal blessing to Judah and he says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. Judah would be one of the two tribes that would still remain in control of the temple. Uh, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. Until peace come. Peace incarnate come. And unto him shall the gathering of all the people be. Now, again, both the Jewish... Uh, scholars and the the Gentile scholars believe this to be a reference to Messiah. There's Old Testament reasons why. Turn with me, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55, and Isaiah writes of the Lord and his coming and what he will do. 
Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 5, he says, Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not. He's speaking of God and the Messiah, and he's speaking uh, outside of that which Israel had known. Israel had only known themselves to be the people of God. They were the chosen ones. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not. And nations, plural, nations, plural, that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God. And for the Holy One of Israel, and he hath glorified, for he hath glorified thee. This is a direct reference to Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, uh, the Koinonia Greek uh, translates the word ethnos into nations. Ethnos into nations. Uh, we anglicize ethnos today into ethnicities. Ethnicities. See, I do not believe in races, but I do understand there are different ethnicities. You say, what's the difference? Well, the difference is, is this. There's one race, but many ethnicities. Amen? Uh, that being said, he will call, he will call a ethnicity, ethnicity that he, did not, that he did not know, and he will call ethnicities that did not know him. And they will run. They will run to the Lord. Why? For the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. Turn with me to Zechariah. Zechariah in chapter 2 and verse 11. Another proof text of, again, let me read, uh, well, I won't read it, but a proof text of Shiloh bringing all men to him or gathering all men to himself uh, here in Zechariah chapter 2 and verse 11. And many nations, many ethnicities shall be joined to the Lord in that day and shall be my people and I will dwell in the midst of thee well, I guess that's another reference to Emmanuel, God with us in our midst. I will dwell in the midst of thee, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto thee. Now, you say, well, that's all well and good, Pastor, but I'm not so sure about that whole ethnicity thing. And uh, you know what? I, I'm proud of my race, and uh, I, I like to keep that. Well, pride is of the devil. Let's go ahead and dismantle that right now. Turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Um, you know, Christianity, some are saying Christianity is a, a white man's religion. <laughs> How ridiculous. First of all, Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a relationship with God the Father through God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Here in Acts chapter 17 and verse 26, he, uh, the word of God reads, God has made of one blood all the nations. Hath made of one blood all the ethnicities of men. He hath made of one blood all the nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. That means he has even determined the countries of where and what they will make up. God has done that. People think that they're in control and they think that they do and know so much. They really don't. God has done all this. Uh, I've said it before and it's a cute little saying, but it's nonetheless true. History is his story. It is his story. And when Shiloh come, even as Shiloh has came once, as Shiloh came and was lifted up, he drew all men to him. Turn with me to the book of John. Turn with me to the book of John. And I want to read the words of Jesus Christ real quick. I want to read the words of Jesus, uh, John chapter 12. John chapter 12 and verse 32. Jesus says, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Jesus says, If I, me, Jesus, if I be lifted up I, from the earth, I will draw all men to me. 
I, I've been teaching this here uh, inadvertently, a little here, a little there, line upon line, precept upon precept, all year long, technically for 10 years. So if you hadn't gotten it, prick up your ears now. There, there's one, one interpretation for Scripture, but many applications. The one interpretation for that is, if Jesus Christ is lifted up from the earth on the cross, he will draw all men to him. Why? It's the sacrifice. It's the sacrifice that brings peace between man and God. Until then, we are at enmity with God. Our sin separates us from a thrice holy God. But He, becoming the sin sacrifice, being lifted up on the cross, side pierced, brow punctured, hands nailed, heart burst, giving up the ghost, died on our behalf, has been drawing all men to him for 2,000 years because of the love, the extravagant passion, compassion, kindness, and grace shown that day. But it would have been meaningless lest he had been lifted up after the resurrection. Ah, another application. One interpretation he was lifted up on the cross, willingly going there, obedient unto the Father. He is our Shiloh. I have tranquility, peace with God through my Christ because of his sacrifice. And how do I know? Because he lives. Amen. He lives. And because he ascended that day in the midst of his disciples, and they watched him ascend into the clouds, and the angel said, Hey, you, you, you disciples, you, you followers of Jesus, what are you staring at the sky for? I'm paraphrasing, Mike. Don't you know that the way he went, that's the way he's coming back. For 2,000 years, he's been drawing all men to him, all ethnicities, all nations will gather at his feet. All nation, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. They will gather at his feet. They will throw crowns and jewels. Praises sung like you have never heard before. Perfect pitch, perfect harmony for eternity. Why? Because he was lifted up. And because he was lifted up. And because... He is Shiloh. He is that tent that though was folded up, deity was never taken from it. And indeed, it was resurrected and now resides at the right hand of the throne of glory. 